Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 70. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, we're going to talk about staying loose. Yeah, and tension. Yeah. So Matt had a a good comment at the beginning of this episode when we were prepping, which is that (laughs) everyone is probably more tense now than we've ever been in our lives, but that's not specifically what we're talking about here. And we're living in a state of tension. (laughs) Constant Constant. tension. We're we're not doing anything athletic or to burn calories, but yet we're just all incredibly tense regardless. (laughs) Maybe there's a correlation between the two. I think if you burn a lot of calories, maybe the tension is eased a little bit. So... We're specifically talking about when you're grappling, making sure that you don't over tense your muscles or keep your muscles in a constant state of tension. Now, this is crucially important for a variety of reasons that we're going to talk about here today. Really, the main reasons why you want to avoid tensing up is first of all, because it telegraphs your intentions to your opponent, right? And it also telegraphs your fear because if you're constantly tense, your opponent will know that you're afraid and that gives them a mental edge. Additionally, we're going to talk about how when you are constantly tense, it burns out your muscles, which is the other downside, right? It it is hard to maintain constant tension all the time. And then the third reason why tension is something that you want to avoid is because if you're constantly tense, then your opponent can more easily manipulate manipulate you and move you around, right? I mean, it's like the difference between like trying to pull and tug on a on a loose rope versus trying to pull and tug on a stick. If the lever is really, really tight and inflexible, then it's easy to yank that lever and pull the person off balance. But if that lever is always loose, then when you give it a good pull, it's harder to move the rest of the body with it. So yeah, that's one of the most common things you could say about beginners is that they're just too tense and you know, generally if people are kind of spazzy, well, usually they're over aggressive or they, they rely on strength or speed, but they're usually always tense. And as a result, like brand new beginners who have this quality tend to gas out really quickly. Yeah. So I just don't think their, <clears throat> their heart can handle the, the amount of, well, first of all, the amount of stress and, and decision making that's going on when they're so new, but also just like the amount of oxygen that's required to keep that kind of tension in your body. Yeah, and then yeah. you realize as you go on, it's better to stay relaxed and sort of, uh, you know, go with it a little bit more and, and, and roll, you know, fluid fluidly rather than just meeting everything with force yeah when you watch commentary on high level grappling or mma you'll often hear people say in a complimentary fashion look how loose that guy is he's so loose out there and that's a really good thing right that means that the person is comfortable and they're relaxed and that means that they're in charge of energy consumption whereas if someone is really rigid and tense it means usually that they're not really in control but also that they're going to burn out their energy a lot quicker and yeah matt to your point where you see this manifest especially is at white belt level and i remember when i was a white belt and a lot of the senior guys would tell me this and they would say you know you're 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 too tense in there you got to loosen up and they would even say that you know you're telegraphing because especially when you stand up with someone if you're doing judo you really notice this you really can feel the other guy being tense and if you've ever grappled with a high level judoka you'll know that they're not tense at all And, and that's one of the things that makes them hard to actually grapple with is because their arms are so loose and until they're ready to throw yeah they're, they're not tense at all until it's time to be tense and that and i find like you know doing judo for like almost a decade now i'm just starting to realize sort of what i should be looking for uh in terms of the feel you know because uh, you know i usually pull guard when i when i train i'm not a huge takedown guy but i do like to train judo and um it takes a long time to develop that feel when you're standing and it's funny, like when you go with a high level judo, judoka and you're standing, you can really feel how they're able to hide their intentions and then just throw you before you can do anything. And a lot of that is just they're staying loose until they can create an opportunity. And then before you know it, your balance is kind of broken and it's too late to to defend at that point. That's one of the most frustrating things when you're sparring with a high level judoka is it feels like they're not even trying. Like you're in there just hoping to stay alive. And to them, it's like, they're, they're, it's like their mind isn't even there. They're so relaxed. And you can feel that too when you're sparring with a high level jujitsu practitioner. But 
it's much more subtle. Whereas with judo, it's a good example to understand how important it is to stay loose because you can feel it directly when you're standing up with someone. And I mean, I don't know if this is universally true, but at least for me, standing up is a much more terrifying experience than being on the ground rolling around. So it, it, to me anyway, it's much more pronounced when you can feel how loose the other person is. And then at some point in time, it's like, they crack a whip and there's a moment of tension and they route all of their force through that tension and it's enough to send you flying. Yeah. And not, and not even just standing, but like you mentioned on the ground, um, there's so many little transitions that happen in split second that are just, you know, constant adjustments to each other's tension and just small little like changing angles of the hips and little subtle, subtle things like that are really, uh, that that's really what high level jujitsu is. It's not these giant big movements, but more just these little adjustments. And yeah, it, ta- it takes like, you know, over a decade to really become a master of this and feel this because, uh, when you're starting out, it's just, you know, you just gas yourself out over and over again, right? And you just get nowhere doing that against someone who can feel everything that you're doing. Yeah, I think that that's actually a side effect of the way that people train. And one of the problems with the way that people learn in class, right? When we go to most gyms, they're going to teach you technique of the day, right? And that kind of puts it into your head that the way you do jujitsu is you like pick a technique and you do that technique and then you're good. But that's not really how jujitsu works, right? Jujitsu is a constant game of trying to maintain your alignment while breaking your opponents. And if you succeed at that, then eventually you're going to get that sweep or you're going to get that takedown. But you don't try to force a sweep or force a takedown. You just keep trying to attack the person's alignment. And Matt, to your point, once you realize that, you realize it's not about doing big explosive movements. It's more about microtransitions and making constant small adjustments so that your opponent can just never get comfortable. And one of the keys to doing that is just not to be tense. Like if you're constantly tense, it's too obvious to your opponent what you're going to do. I tell people that, you know, when they're starting out, if you want to know two of the things you can do right away that will dramatically improve your game, like don't even worry about techniques yet. Number one is stay loose. Number two is control the breath. Those are the two things that even before you get into the realm of (laughs) how does jujitsu actually work, if you can do those two things, you're already going to be like light years ahead of anyone else who just showed up for their first day. Yeah, it's like if you're lifting weights or running your breath has to be like rhythmic and it needs to be controlled because if uh like if if you ever go swimming you know you try and swim laps and you don't have your breath under control you get exhausted right and it's literally the the same sort of thing you have to train yourself to to cognitively do the movements uh with good technique and do it at such a rhythm that you you know you can breathe at the right time and also do it in a way that you're not going to gas yourself out which is it sounds like we're describing jujitsu basically exactly. Like, yeah. I like to think about swimming just like jujitsu because if your technique's bad, you, you know, you're going to exert way too much energy or you're not going to go very fast. But if it, it's funny, it's almost like once you find your technique in swimming, it's like less is more. Yes. You know, the, the more smooth your technique is, the more, uh, and almost calming it is the, you know, your endurance will be better and you will, you will be a better swimmer in terms of like, you know, speed and whatnot. So it's really important to, you know, sort of look at, I look at physical activities like this now, now that I've done jujitsu for so long is when I try and learn something physical, I try and think of like, okay, there, there's clearly the, there's the best possible way you could do this. Like, you know, if I go ice skating, it's not like I'm just going to develop my own way of ice skating and it's going to be really good. There's, there's ways to learn how to ice skate properly. And then there's ways to do it, you know, poorly. And if you don't think about always getting your technique to be as best as, uh, as good as it can be and doing things as efficiently as it as can be, you're just not going to be a good ice skater, right? And jujitsu is the exact same way. There's a, there's good way to learn jujitsu. And then there's not such a good way to learn jujitsu. Yeah, I agree with you totally. When it comes to efficiency, whether or not you're tense is a really good indicator as to whether you're doing technique properly. I remember when I was doing, uh, I think it was a blue belt test with a student. And of course, I charged him 250 bucks for the privilege. I remember that the feedback I had for him was that he was too tense. And I specifically told him as a pointer, be mindful of when you're tense, because that's an indication that you're not being efficient. A common 
workaround that people do when they're not being efficient as possible is they start relying on strength. And so if you ever catch yourself being overly tense, that's a good indication that you might be using strength when you shouldn't be using strength. So this is something that I learned to be mindful of that I might be doing, which was really helpful. If I'm ever sparring with someone and I realize that my muscles are really tense, what that could mean is that I'm relying on strength rather than relying on technique, which tells me I'm doing something wrong and because i have no strength <laughs> to me it's really good not to rely on that aspect of the game and uh also staying loose helps with decision making because you almost it's almost like you're taking a step back like uh in a in the third person and sort of watching what's happening rather than uh fighting off of pure reaction because you need a, a balance of both in jujitsu and i find it you know, at the highest level, you're going to get a mixture of both. You're going to get guys that uh, are extremely tense, but only when they need to be. And they can also make incredibly like decisions incredibly fast. So it'll be, you know, very relaxed. And then before you know it, when it's time to go, they go. Right. And then this is kind of, I guess, the perfect blend of what you want. So, yeah, you know, if you, if you sort of take yourself away from that constant tension, it's almost like you can, you can feel more, you can understand what's going on more and you can make Probably a smarter decision based on that. Yeah, it's almost like stepping back out of your own body. It's a form of mindfulness. If you're always constantly tense, then you're in the fight. But if you can take a step back and become aware that you're being tense, then it's almost like you're viewing yourself in the third person. And that allows you to relax and think about things strategically rather than being in this constant fight or flight mode. Yeah, and then, and a great example for for tension versus staying loose. I saw a, a new video that Ryan Hall put out. It's actually, it's a new video on an old guard, uh, deep half guard, which was sort of hot, like 15 years ago, it was really popular. And he, and it's, it's nothing new. He was just explaining how, um, proper regulated tension as Rob would call it on the lever creates the deep half guard efficiently. And if you lose that regulated tension, um, you, the, the position basically falls apart. So he was just explaining about how, you know, when you underhook the, the leg that you're underneath in the deep half with your foot and you can, uh, he's basically talking about extending each end of the lever so that you're sort of, uh, creating tension within the leg. Because if you, if you can't do that, if you can't control the end of the lever and then the hip with your hand as he was doing it, if you lose one of those control points, then you lose all the tension and the guy basically starts tearing apart your deep half guard. So if you're going to play a position like deep half guard, as Rob has said recently, that he gave up deep half guard because he's trying to make less lazy decisions in life. <laughs> he, was, he was basically just saying that, um, you know, th this is what makes the deep half guard work. If you don't have this regulated tension, you're, you know, you're just going to, it's just going to fall apart from there. Yeah. Deep half guard is a really good example of where you can see staying loose in action. I mean, it a good example is the lockdown, for example. <laughs> a mistake that a lot of people make in the lockdown when they're stuck in the lockdown is they try to really flex their leg and, yeah. you know, just basically just bull rush their way out of it. That doesn't work. Anyone who knows how to get out of the lockdown knows that the trick is you let your leg go loose like a noodle and then you can get it out relatively easily. That's a good example, too, of where staying loose is important because if you're loose, it's harder for your opponent to control where your leg goes. So really good example of how staying loose can be critical yeah or even like a like compression locks like a, a calf slicer or uh and a bicep slicer these moves are much less effective if you let your arm uh if you don't flex your arm as much which can be really difficult especially if you're stuck in like the arm bar position like the spider web position and then your opponent goes for a bicep slicer that you know d depending on your body type and their body type that move sucks like it hurts um, but if you, if you really flex your arm and squeeze really tight as you're defending, it's going to hurt a lot more than if your arm just goes limp, right? So that's kind of something to, to think about is sometimes when you're in submissions, it's better to relax tension and then the submission doesn't come on as fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something that I remember learning as I started to get a lot of experience getting choked is that when you're getting choked, panicking and getting really tense is not the way to get out. You actually want to relax because if nothing else that's going to slow down your blood flow and make it harder for your opponent to choke you yeah um, and you you gas out so much quicker if you're in a choke and you're trying to 
desperately get out because you're losing oxygen, you're losing energy. And I, I also find like, you know, when you're choking someone, you hear, you hear a noise, like a gurgle, <laughs> you know, you're onto something, right? Yeah. That's, you just, if, if I'm choking someone and I hear that noise, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue that as much as I can, because I know, okay, something's on here. Like there, it is there. Yeah. Although incidentally, that's a fun way to screw with people is to start making gurgling noises when there's nothing. <laughs> just fake it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always wonder, like, I've never seen anyone, um, I've never seen anyone like fake, fake getting choked. And then, well, I've seen Brazilian tap. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. That's what the common name is. But like never anyone faking, like going limp and then getting out. Although I did see, I've seen someone play possum one time in an Instagram video. And then like they both stood up. The other guy thought it was, it was over a reset. And the other guy just jumped on him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a risky strategy that's because a risky strategy. yeah, because if the if the ref thinks you're out, then it's done, right? It doesn't matter if you were faking it or not. He didn't fake going out. I think he faked like it, like the ref had called a reset, but the ref never did. That's and clever. So it was clever, and I was like, that's not really gentlemanly, but I guess that is <laughs> an, a, a form of mental jujitsu, really. Like he out outsmarted the guy. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of cool. Yep. Um, But another thing that matters too when you're applying submissions, common mistake that junior people make is they just crank it, right? Like they they have Mm -hmm. what looks like an arm bar or a triangle or a choke or what have you, and they just crank it, but they don't really have it. And what winds up happening is they wind up burning out all of their own energy and accomplishing nothing. And we've all been there. This is a mistake that everyone makes. Probably one of the most common examples where you see this is with the triangle or with the arm triangle, people just crank it with all of their energy but they don't actually have the choke and so they just burn themselves out and one of the really important things to learn is that submissions are not about power and tension they're about securing the proper position totally breaking your opponent's alignment and then at that point you're probably going to be able to do most of the submission without using a lot of tension, but the tension is just additive. It's, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're using the tension as a substitute for proper leverage. So generally speaking, when you're in a submission, if you catch yourself just cranking it as hard as you can, that's usually a good indication that you're not going to get it. And if you do get it, it's kind of a false positive because you might have just gotten lucky. It's far better if you focus on breaking the person's alignment and then only start applying tension when you've totally got the submission locked up. Yeah. And in, in, let's say um, like a lever based attack, like a, an arm bar or even a leg lock, I think things are a little bit easier to follow with something like an arm bar because I think more people are more familiar with like an arm bar submission rather than a heel hook submission. Cause not everyone knows leg locks. Right. But, but essentially to your point, you know, like tension is really important, but um, th- there could be a lot of tension. But if it's not, you know, performing in the correct direction or if it's not applied properly, then it's it doesn't really add to the submission at all. Like imagine an arm bar, but instead of pulling your heels to your butt, you're um, you're extending your legs straight out. So there's no wedge on your opponent's forearm and so therefore they can move, right? Like the, you could have as much tension as you want, but there's a good chance they're going to be able to escape because you're not really taking them out of alignment, right? And I think, I think uh, you know, you want to compare that with like, say, a knee bar or a heel hook. You know, you, you, could, you could crank the heel as much as you want in a heel hook, but if you don't have proper wedging in the, in the correct direction with your legs, then there's going to be no submission, right? And there's going to usually be a, a wide open escape for your opponent. So it, you can't just apply tension and expect it to do it uh, to compensate for technique. That was a really good point, Steve. You have to make sure that you know which direction the tension needs to go in. You need to have their position correct. And then if you do that all correctly, um, another thing with leg locks is like managing your upper body and lower body tension. Like you're So you're not cranking all with your arms and your legs are kind of loose, but you're sort of uh, coordinating it's like a double attack where you're coordinating your upper body and lower body to perform separate tasks and that's how you really get the best finishing mechanics for for something like that yeah coordinating your arms and your legs and actually your head is tremendously challenging but it's one of the most important things to get finishing power and um, that that's actually a good example of some in some situations you do need tension and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit but you know we talked about how one of the reasons to 
avoid being tense is because it's going to save energy. Now, if you're constantly tense, then the problem is you're you're going to burn out, right? It doesn't matter how athletic you are. Everyone has a limit and eventually your muscles are just going to burn out. And at that point, it gets very hard to defend your, yourself, right? It's very, very hard, regardless of how aggressive or athletic you are, to mount an effective defense when your body just isn't responding. So that's part of the reason why it's important to learn to regulate tension and to develop some awareness of what your body is doing and if you catch yourself being overly tense to use that as a learning opportunity that you need to loosen up there a little bit and focus more on technique i saw lovato post a video on instagram he's like okay guys here's a secret to how i you know uh, 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 to train your choke and he literally does a rear naked choke on his leg and then he holds it and he like squeezes for two to three minutes straight interesting and, and i, I yeah, I talked to Rob about that. I'm like, dude, I don't really know what. The, do you think this would really help that much? Like, maybe in terms of a rear naked choke when you're squeezing someone's head off. But I really don't know if that's gonna, if that's a good compensation for you know getting uh, the proper positioning and getting everything right. You know, it's that's literally training for like brute squeezing isometric force. But it is somewhat valid. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, the the more conditioned you are, the better off you're going to be. But I would not suggest substituting if technique. If you're a white belt, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I would not <laughs> I would not suggest substituting technique for power. That is probably not a good strategy. Like I guess in terms of in like Lovato's terms, like he's one of the you know one of the greatest. And he's got such good technique that I think that he can focus on stuff like that. But if you're like a white belt or a blue belt and you're thinking, how can I finish my, you know, how can I raise my choking percentage and all that stuff? I don't think it's, uh, you know, squeezing your own leg. That's going to help you. It's, it's diversifying your attack, breaking your opponent's alignment and, you know, more training. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think once you reach a certain level, it's okay to, to focus on your strength more than, you know, when you're first starting out. Well, we've talked about this and how at a very high level, you take any advantage you can get. And if everyone's technique at that level is super sharp, then you want to have any other advantage that the other person might not have thought about. And having just a crazy gorilla grip is something that is useful. I mean, if nothing else, right, like if you get a, a rear naked on someone and you don't really have it, but you do have the strength and the muscular endurance to just squeeze for five minutes, I mean, that's something, right? And you can really make the other person's life suck. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it as a strategy, but it is an advantage, right? Having crazy gorilla Gorilla grip strength is an advantage. So at a high level, I don't, you know, I understand why that's something that he would want to develop. Yeah. Squeezing the face. Very good. Very <laughs> good strategy. Actually, very effective uh, in jujitsu is uh, I've, I've almost given up on like trying to go under the chin right away. I just mm -hmm. go across the face and then try and crank the neck until you can get get under the chin. Yeah. It's I, like you're funneling into the into the actual choke by attacking the face. I agree. I mean, I'm. <laughs> I'm so not, effective and you see it so much now in competition. Yeah, I'm not so mean that I'm going to grind the person's nose, although it works. Uh, but I agree that doing... If you want to meddle, you would. Yeah, doing the old school thing where you try to swim your hand under the guy's jaw, that is just not going to be effective. Like, I find it way more effective to try to force the person's jaw to the side, which yeah. opens up the neck. I find that's way more effective than trying to just lead with your hand. Yeah, that's too gentlemanly. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Go right over the bridge of the nose. It is it is legit, though, because it, it really does stun your, your opponent, and they, they have to react to that. Like, they have to try and disengage that the tension of that choke and usually that creates a two-on-one and then they allow uh, it allows them to have a free arm to redig the choke right well so. the thing is attacking the nose in that manner is not illegal you yeah. can you know and so but the problem is a lot of people don't train that so they don't expect it so if you don't expect someone to mash your nose and then suddenly you're in there and you're defending your neck but the other guy goes for your nose instead. But by the time you respond to that, yeah. it's going to be way too late. It, it is a valid strategy. And it's important to train against that and to understand that you can protect your neck all you want. But if the guy gets at your nose or your jaw, he's probably yeah. going to move your head anyway. So exactly. just doing the home alone defense where you put your, your hands up to your neck is probably not the wisest way to block a choke. Like you need to block the guy's hands completely. At least that's what I focus on doing now is I don't just put my hands up. I try to 
proactively stop the other person from getting their hand in place in the first place. Like I try mm-hmm. to grab their hand if I can. Yeah. And I think what's really important to realize is, you know, we can talk about defending the choke, like hand fighting, but also just denying them the proper head position, which we've talked about in recent episodes where, you know, someone's on your back. If their head is not beside your head and not being a, uh, a wedge that denies you escape, then you can kind of use that to escape. But if they have a, you know, a grip around your neck or your face and they have their head blocking your escape, then you're in a lot more trouble just because there's no way to get your head out of there. So makes sense. Yeah. So another reason why you want to be mindful of staying loose is to deny your opponent leverage. Now, so much of jujitsu is about gaining leverage. You're trying to grab a lever on your opponent's body and move it. And as in the example at the beginning of this episode, it's a lot easier to get leverage over something that is stiff versus something that is loose. If you grab the end of a rope and try to pull it, you know, it, you're not going to get a lot of leverage. But if you grab a stick and you try to pull it, you can get a lot more leverage off of that. And you should think of your arms and your legs like that, where if your your arms and legs are constantly stiff, if your opponent grabs it and yanks it, it's going to take your whole body off balance and it's going to make it a lot easier for your opponent to get Kazushi on you. Uh, this is ultra critical when you're standing up, but it's also even critical from the ground as well. If the person's in your guard, for example, it's a, a lot easier to arm drag them if they're being stiff, because when you arm drag them, their entire alignment is going to go out of whack when you succeed. So you can deny your opponent a lot of leverage simply by staying loose in most scenarios. Uh, and it's very, you'll notice too, when you spar with someone who's really good, when they're sitting there in your guard or whatever, they're usually pretty relaxed and chilled out. Whereas when you spar with someone who is more new, they're <laughs> like, usually they, you can just look in their eyes and tell that like, it's, it's kill or be killed. <laughs> Uh, but at a, a more advanced level, you do experience that more inner calm and that looseness, and that makes it hard to off balance someone who's just sitting there in guard. That's like if you ever are partnered up with the brand new guy to drill, and then you, you're supposed to do a technique on them, and they just limp noodle it, yeah. and they just lie there, and you can't drill the technique because just, it doesn't work. It's like maybe that's how you defeat jujitsu in, in a real situation: is you just just go, go limp. fetal. Yeah, you just go limp, and uh, I can't use jujitsu on you now. <laughs> It's true though, like if, if they're just limp, you can't really do what you want to do. You you almost need that realistic reaction for the techniques to work. Yeah. <laughs> Please do not take this as an endorsement of the fetal strategy in jujitsu, but to your point, it is very hard to get leverage on anything if your opponent just doesn't tense their limbs, right? It becomes a, a lot harder. And part of the reason why Kazushi works is when you off balance someone, they have to compensate by posting on something, right? Normally they have to post on an arm or post on a leg. And to do that, they have to make that arm or leg tense. And that's how you start the process of off balancing them, right? You'll notice that as you start to get Kazushi and as the person starts to have to post, their limbs are forced to tense up because if they don't, they're going to probably face plant or fall on their back. So that's kind of an example of what you're going for here, because once those limbs get tense, it's easier to move them where you want them to go. Yeah. Staying re- relaxed is very important. Yeah. Whether you're standing or on the ground, definitely really important. Yeah. Yeah. Not give them the tension they need to move you around. So now that said, we've hopefully instilled that you don't want to be tense in most situations, but you also don't want to just always be totally loose. There are times when tension is appropriate. You'll notice, for example, if you're sparring with a judoka, when they go for a throw, they tense just for like a split second. Um, and you'll notice that when you are sparring with a high level grappler on the ground, they're usually pretty loose. But once they start to apply a submission, when, once they've got the submission, they'll start to apply tension. So there's a place for tension. It's not inherently a bad thing. But the thing you need to be aware of is that when you go tense, It exposes weaknesses that we've discussed before, right? Number one, it shows your opponent what your intentions are. Number two, it burns out your muscles. And number three, it makes it easier for your opponent to get leverage on you. So you want to avoid tension, but there is a time and a place to do it. And using tension strategically is such a a key part of jujitsu. So let's use stand up as an example and judo throws in particular, because this is probably a very easily understood example of where tension is appropriate. If you're sparring with a good judo or judoka, you'll notice that they're very loose and they're very tense. But as soon as they get Kazushi and they're ready to throw they're they get tense really, really quickly and suddenly, and then they go. And it's kind of like a whip cracking, right? They're not constantly totally tense all the time. They're loose. And then for 
just a moment. They, they tense up and they concentrate all of their force into a single moment, much like a whip does when it cracks. That's what you want to be doing. Um, and so, but the thing is though, when you do tense up like that, First of all, you only want to tense up if there's ever a purpose to what you're doing. Like, again, you're going for a throw and this is the time to do it, or you're going for a submission and you have it fully locked up. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you only want to go tense when you're doing so in such a way that your opponent cannot exploit you. So for example, if you do a judo throw and you tense up, but you didn't get Kazushi on your opponent and they're just standing there and they're totally fine. You're vulnerable. Yeah, if you tense up, they're going to be able to counter the throw on you. So you only want to get tense like that when you know that your opponent is not able to counter that tension. And, and similarly on the ground, right? If you get, if you tense yourself up for no good reason, it can expose an arm or a leg or make it easier for your opponent to, to get out. I mean, an example of where you could tense up on the ground and it's totally fine. There's that escape you can do from side control where if you can get into the guy's armpit, you can put your hand in his armpit pit and you can stiff arm him away and then mm -hmm. hip escape you, mm -hmm. you know the one i'm talking about yeah. um that's a very good the escape. seated position one yeah 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 so a seated position. yeah you so basically you try to get to a seated position you put your your hand like a c cup in the guy's armpit and then you, you stiff arm him and push him away so in that case you're tensing your arm but it's okay to tense your arm and to extend your arm there because since you're pushing into your opponent's armpit, there's no way they can counter it, right? You're pushing them away. Um, if They can't easily armbar you or, or take advantage of the fact that your arm is stiff and it's exposed. Unless they redirect the frame. Exactly. Exposing the and, if, and if that happens, then you would loosen and retract your arm, yeah. right? Because you don't want to leave it out there. Mm -hmm. So it is okay to get tense, but you only want to do that in situations where there's no opening for your opponent. Yeah, if you don't have, if you don't understand the concept of regulated tension, something that Rob talks about a lot, like like I discussed in the deep half um, example, you're just gonna not have good lever control. This is really important in in uh, especially nogi when you're relying a lot more on the the control of levers to move your opponent rather than proxy grips like you can in the gi. In the gi, if I make a grip, you know I I can control the end of your pants and not necessarily have like. Uh, as much tension controlling the lever as I do just grabbing your pants and being able to move the lever by proxy. But if it's, if it's no gi and I'm doing like a, like any crab ride situation or wedge hook situation, if I don't understand how to keep the tension regulated, then I basically will just lose lever control. Right. And sometimes that'll like in a crab ride situation, just flaring your knee outward, um, or inward can be the difference between having good control on that lever or having poor control on that lever, right? Uh, another example would be like, let's say you're in seated guard, like a sit-up guard, and you have your in uh, your shin, like in-step guard. Um, if your knee is flared out, then there's not going to be a lot of great regulated tension. Your partner is usually going to be able to disengage that frame. But if you have like a strong seated guard with a hooked in-step, and then your, your shin is... Uh, pointing up so that there's a lot of contact between your shin and his there's going to be way more surface area covered and you're going to have better regulated tension and maintaining the sit-up guard so long story short you know you can really maximize how you're going to be able to control levers if you just understand how to actually the, the term i use is activate the lever that, that was something after rob taught me about levers i was sort of thinking okay well even if I control a lever, that doesn't necessarily mean I have like the maximum control I can possibly have. Whereas if I if I really apply what he called regulated tension and really focus on how to maximize that tension, my lever control like basically you just become stickier. It become it feels like you can uh, everything's more grippy and you know less chance of of you losing that control of the lever without the gi. Yeah, you're making constant connection with the person you're basically not giving them a situation where they can they can move to an angle and then there's no connection anymore because once that happens they can start to move on to a different position when you're playing a hook based position like that like in step guard it's so critical to always be checking the person's motion uh, you don't need to always be tipping them off balance but you need to make sure that they can never move around such that you lose that connection because that's when they escape and that's that's such a key part of managing those guards where you're not really clamping onto the person yeah think about like a single leg x if you don't have that constant tension in your hips and your spine and you're pinching your knees then the whole thing just falls apart you know the, basically tension is it, it, when used properly creates control Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And another thing to bear in mind too is that if you do need to apply tension, then like if you're trying to apply force to move your opponent, don't just 
flex up and apply constant pressure. This is a mistake that a lot of people make. Like they'll, let's say for example, that you want to arm drag someone. What you don't want to do is grab onto their arms, super flexed, and then try to pull it. You know, it it should be more that you're loose. And then for a split second, you're not. Basically, you're trying to compress all of the force into a small moment in time. That's a lot better than grabbing and pulling. Uh, because in addition to being telegraphed, it's actually just not that efficient. Um, so that, that's a common mistake that people make too, where they'll like grab on a limb and they'll just pull it and they won't stop pulling it. You want to be loose and then compress all of that force very quickly. And then you're going to have a lot more success with trying to move the person. And like we mentioned in terms of finishing mechanics, if you ever have grabbed any, well, really any submission, I like to use the example of like a, 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 a gi choke. You know, if you don't have everything in position and you go right to the finishing mechanics and you're squeezing, it, nothing happens. You know, you can't, and then you can't make those adjustments later. You have to make your small adjustments first and then apply tension last. Definitely. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I think that was a great talk on tension. Just to cover again what we talked about here today, there's three reasons why you want to stay loose. One is to mask your intentions. The other is to save energy and prevent burnout. And then the third one is to deny your opponent leverage. And on top of that, there is also a few situations where tension is okay. One of the situations is when there is a purpose to being tense, like when you're tensing up to go for a throw or when you're applying tension on a submission. But you also want to make sure when you apply tension that you do so in a manner that cannot be exploited. So for example, you would never want to stiffen your arm and stick it out in such a way that your opponent can armbar you. You want to avoid that. So tension can be used strategically. It's not to be avoided at all costs, but you just need to know what situations it's okay to use and what situations it's dangerous to use. Matt, anything else you want to add on the topic of tension? That was a pretty good chat. I yeah, think. I thought so too. Okay, so just to recap the mental models that we discussed today, of course, we talked about staying loose, the concept that um, being overly tense can be used against you. We talked about micro transitions. Uh, it's very hard to succeed in jujitsu when you're just doing big explosive movements all the time. You're better off making small, constant, nonstop adjustments versus big explosive movements. We talked about masking your intentions and the problem with being overly tense is it totally telegraphs your intentions. And you can actually get away with this for quite a long time. Uh, but once you start getting up to purple, brown, black belt level, if you are telegraphing your intentions, your opponent is going to kill you. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm probably not going to get to the next belt. <laughs> yeah. So I think people get a lot of false positives at the junior levels because they can get away with this. But once you get up to the high levels, you cannot afford to telegraph your intent. We talked about mindfulness. One of the most important ways to combat being overly tense is to develop a mindfulness and an awareness of what your body is doing. And that kind of allows you to take a step back and look at your body the way like a third person would, you know, so you're not so stuck inside what's happening to you right at the moment. And if you can learn to kind of observe from the outside what your your own body is doing, you can become aware of when you're getting tense and you can be more calm in very stressful moments. We talked about the core mechanics of jujitsu. So in this case, lever control, so closely tied to tension because the, the tenser a lever is, the easier it is to control. We talked about kazushi. Uh, when you get kazushi on your opponent and they're off balance, they're going to have to post either on their, their arms, their legs, or their head. <laughs> and that's going to require them to tense their limb. And that's how you ultimately throw them or move them because that tension is what takes away their ability to get base. We talked about force compression. So if you want to apply force to someone, it's better to do it in small bursts versus in big, long, protracted pushes. And probably one of the best examples of this is the way that judokas go for a throw, right? They When they apply force, they do it like a whip cracking where it's all concentrated into a very small moment in time and we talked about finishing mechanics so in this context don't go tense and you know use all of your squeezing power until you've already locked the submission you do not want to try to compensate and muscle your way through a submission if you don't have the person's alignment completely broken mm -hmm. and yeah i don't know if you if you said the word but basically what you're describing a lot there steve is kazushi in terms of how judoka you know, off balance their opponent. And then it's like a whip cracking. They have a, a huge explode of energy in a certain direction, right? Uh, um, understanding how to create that Kazushi from standing or from the bottom on the ground. It's, 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 uh, that's going to create a lot of disruption in your opponent's, uh, alignment. And that's kind of what you're looking for. And sometimes those push pull movements can 
they can take like three, four, five different setups before something finally breaks through. So it is a lot like you're, you know, at the higher levels, it's it's almost like you're trying to trick your opponent in ways just instead of, you know, using words, you're using uh, force in different directions. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like what they say, you know, if you push into someone, you can you can pretty much rely on the fact that they're going to push it back into you. And if you pull them towards you, you can rely on the fact that they're going to pull themselves back. Right. So it's these are sort of how you're going to set up those push pull reactions. Yeah. A lot of the time getting Kazushi while standing up requires you to chain two different things together because people by default, just when they're standing, they have pretty good base. Usually the first attack is going to get them to wobble a little, little bit, but they'll still retain most of their base. But it's when you start taking into account how they will predictably post or readjust their balance, that that's when you can really exploit them. It's the same in wrestling too, right? Where the goal is to get the person to take a step forward with a certain foot or to move forward or move backward. And you can exploit and execute a takedown based on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wrestling is very much also, it looks like it's just constant tension to the jujitsu fighter's Mm -hmm. eye because quite frankly, we're so fucking lazy. <laughs> like if you watch two wrestlers, it's just like nonstop and it is nonstop tension, but there's also so many little uh, battles that are going on that we can't see where they're pushing into each other and they're creating reactions. And then, you know, they, they redirect the energy and get like that beautiful foot sweep or they get that snap down. And uh, it's, it, of course it's happening at such a high speed. It's really hard for jujitsu fighters to see that, but there is also a, um, an essence of staying uh, relaxed and applying the tension in wrestling as well. Got it. Got it. Cool. Do you want to do so much harder? Yeah, it is hard. I mean, I do love jujitsu because I am fundamentally lazy. uh, Whereas I look at wrestlers and man, like (laughs) the, the level of effort that they execute is so much higher than what we do. It is ridiculous. And I I think that's part of the reason why it's so hard for jujitsu fighters to deal with wrestlers is because they're just so, powerful they're so aggressive they're so active it that kind of intensity is not something that you normally encounter in jujitsu and i think there's a learning curve to dealing with that Mm -hmm. cool you want to do a question let's do it okay mailbag mailbag okay the gracie episode was great and fairly balanced i just got to spend three weeks off for staff oh man three weeks so this letter came in before the whole covid thing so you're gonna Jesus. you're gonna get a, you're okay <laughs> yeah you're gonna get a lot more than three weeks now though because we're gonna be off for a while i always appreciate your guys's balanced take on everything Forgive me if you've already addressed this. I'm catching up with your back catalog. Your guys' perspective has been big for me, aligning my training partner's help with how I learn. I have a suggestion. Have you guys addressed competition jitters and anxiety specifically? I've set a goal of competing at the IBJJF Masters Worlds Novice 2020 and winning 2021. Again, I think, you're, I think your schedule is now going to be compromised yeah. a little bit. But it's I, too bad that you have that goal. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate the point though. Uh, frankly, reconciling wanting... You you to do big things for my abilities, but being a realist, a serious hobbyist, mind you, is a learning experience. So an episode addressing adrenaline dump for training, especially Mm. for those prone to anxiety would be awesome. Mm. I'm 40 and finally running at things that scare me. My coach. That's good. Yeah. My coach gave me a real, a rear naked choke that made him puke during training. (laughs) Wait, Uh, the, the the coach choked him and the coach puked? No, no, no. The coach. So he's, he's saying that he's 40 and he's learning to run at things that scare him and an example he gives is that his coach gave him a rear naked choke and oh, that made him puke during oh. training i guess because he was oh, anxious God. i'm working like on his coach I <laughs> it sounds horrible his coach will never do it again i'm working hard at managing my fight or flight ending showers with some really cold water etc but it's part of the journey keep up the good work so i think what this guy is basically asking yeah. is do we have any pointers yeah. for dealing with anxiety and jitters and adrenaline dump yeah so we've actually talked about doing a whole series of topics on co- uh, competition probably for the patreon listeners and this is something that i think we actually should probably do a whole episode on just jitters anxiety i mean matt that's something that probably you'll have to do most of the driving on because i'm i'm lazy and i sit on the couch um, although everyone does right now so it's not just yeah. me but maybe we can get give the guy some some pointers or or some advice right now because this is a very real thing and it's not even just about jujitsu right i mean people get anxiety and jitters when they do public speaking when they go for a job interview when they go on a date um today when i go to the grocery store (laughs) (laughs) when i need to get ass wiped from the grocery store i I gotta put on my respirator mask and go to the grocery store i get anxiety um so maybe we could talk you notice when you're out with your with your uh wife but especially your kid 
It's like your anxiety is raised way more. Oh, like yeah. When I'm with my kids out in public trying to shop right now, it's like, well, right now I don't think I'd even take them out. But no, normally we, it's like, you know, you're always more on edge because of that papa bear mentality. Yeah, yeah. We, we actually stopped taking the kids out for groceries. The way that we do it now is if we need groceries, either we order them online or one of us goes out and does the grocery yeah. run while the other one stays home with the kid. I mean, it's it's, it's a weird time. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, let's let's talk about jitters. Address the question. Yeah, let's talk about jitters. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot to unpack there um, because I think the jitters that are associated with competition and the adrenaline dump is, they're two different things, right? Like, I think jitters is everything from during your preparation to fight day um, to right before you step out on the mat. That's that's sort of the jitter portion, right? And you usually, as, at least for me, I don't feel nervous until it's like a few days out and then it starts to hit me and that, okay, now it's time to, you know, preparation is winding down at this point. You're just kind of, you know, resting and leveling out your weight and staying focused mentally. Um the jitters don't really bother me too much until, you know, the, the day of, and then it's like, okay, now I feel, I, I feel motivated and I feel excited, but there's still that level of fear, right? Because, uh, GSP talks about in his book a lot about how fear is actually something to be harnessed, mm -hmm. something to be used as energy if you can harness it. But if you can't harness it, um, you know, it can really take the fight out of you. So it's, it, it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of um, you know, mental preparation and visualization to be able to overcome those jitters and just realize that, uh, you know, everyone has it. I have it. Every, every professional athlete has those jitters. It's just, do you let the jitters, um, you know, affect your performance or do you use them to enhance your performance? And that's all the great athletes have that ability to do. Um, in terms of the adrenaline dump, you know, uh, keep stay, just like what we're talking about today, I think one of the biggest recommendations I can mention is staying loose. That's definitely one of the the best things you can do to manage the adrenaline dump is not ex overexert yourself too fast, especially when you get to like black belt levels and we're talking 10 minute matches. You know, you can't go the whole match 100 100 percent. It's just v very few athletes at the elite level can do that and you you just don't see it happen too often you know uh, you, you see people that are relaxed and a lot of the time the more experienced they are they'll they'll wait a little bit they'll wait a few minutes feel the guy out and then they start going and then by the end that's when they really start turning it up right so it is difficult to know how to manage that adrenaline dump um especially if you have many matches you know if you win a match and you put everything into it and then you feel exhausted and you don't want to fight anymore, then that can take you completely out of the next match. So it's, it's a lot of it is just, you know, it's mental. It's, it's conditioning yourself to stress management and being able to conserve energy when you need to and use it when you need it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, another thing like physical things you can do in the training room that I'd recommend to manage adrenaline dump. Of course, the more preparation you have, the more effective you're going to be and the more confident you'll be. And confidence is a huge thing when you're going into a tournament. So if you know that you're confident, if you know that you've sacrificed and suffered and worked really hard for a competition, then you should go in with a lot more confidence than if you just half-assed it, right? Um, and and that can work in the opposite way too. Some people don't pre prepare for tournaments at all. And then when they go in, if they lose, they're like, oh, I don't really care. I didn't really prepare for it all. That's also not what you want to yeah. do. If you do that, you're really not a serious competitor, which yeah. is also fine. But I feel like if you're going to commit something to it, you're going to put money into it, you should probably do your best to win, right? That's a form of defensive thinking there, right? Where people are basically planning to fail. Like they, yeah. you know, they've already got their excuses lined up before they even try. That's a form of defensive thinking. So exactly. if you catch yourself doing that, where you're intentionally slacking off so that you'll have a baked in excuse that's not good and you see yeah. this in all walks of life where people basically minimize their own involvement so that they have a built-in excuse when it inevitably doesn't succeed you see this at, like at work where people will you know minimize effort that they put into projects because they don't think it's going to succeed so they want to be able to distance themselves from it before the bomb blows up uh, and the same thing in competition whereas i think that a lot of people they hide behind that excuse of i'm just a hobbyist well you know what a lot of really world-class grapplers are just hobbyists <laughs> like that that is just a label it doesn't mean anything you can still be awesome and be a hobbyist so if you come in and basically you're saying like oh i'm a hobbyist well you know obviously i didn't train that hard obviously i'm just doing this for fun it's like well, really like yeah. you you know let, let's put those excuses aside and do the best within the limitations that we have i mean because even if you're a hobbyist like 
everyone has limitations going into a tournament. Sure, your time might be time boxed, so you can't train as hard as people. You might be older and less athletic, but like even the really, really greats, they have limitations on themselves. Like they might be going in with like a blown ACL or something, right? Or a really bad injury. Um, everyone has those limitations and you've got to move past those if you want to go into competition or do anything that is a, a like a pressure cooker environment. Um, another thing that I would add is, you know, I, I don't compete, but I, I have a lot of experience in like high pressure situations. Um, one thing that I would add is again, and we'll probably talk about this in at some point, an episode just in itself, but learn to control your breathing. What your body does dictates what your mind is going to do in a lot of ways. If you can have like very, very controlled, regulated, relaxed breath that will at a physiological level make you more relaxed. It's sort of like how if you smile, it actually makes you happier, even if you weren't happy to begin with. Like having calm, relaxed breathing helps a lot, not just in the fight, but leading up to and preparing as well. And this is the same strategy if you're going in for like a job interview or public speaking or whatever. The other thing is is mindfulness, right? The reason you're getting stressed out is because you're thinking about something scary in the future. Uh, because you're thinking that in like a day, in an hour, in five minutes, you're going to have this big match. And so you're not in the present moment. You're thinking about the future and that's stressing you out now, which will actually reduce your performance in the future. So Mm -hmm. the the best thing to do is to focus on the present moment. Um, Like mindfulness training will teach you how to do this. Like find an anchor and focus on that. Usually breathing is a good one. Like if you get really stressed out, focus on your breathing in and out and try to be very regulated and relaxed in it. And that will help a lot. So it's a good practice to do, not just when you're stressed, but at all times learning to control your breathing. Yeah. In terms of uh, physical preparation, some things that I like to do to kind of, um, I mean, essentially you're describing being a glutton for punishment, but that's kind of what you have to do. If you want to get used to that, that uh, adrenaline dump feeling is you have to burn yourself out. You got, like, I recommend getting um, an assault bike. I bought an assault bike uh, last year and it was a great purchase because it just, it really does simulate that feeling of your lungs burning in, in a fight. Um, and then you're just absolutely exhausted and uh, it can really get your heart going. And then what I like to do right after I hit the bike, I'll burn off like 10 calories as quick as I can. And then if I have a partner available, I'll jump right into a, a session with him where I'm, ex- I'm really tired without any break and then that way you get that exhausted feeling it's like you mimic that that exhausted feeling in competition and then you're you continue grappling so you have to focus on your technique while you're exhausted um other good things you can do would be like uh, mock matches you know um like simulate the fighting scenario in the gym if uh i mean i mean the best way to get really good at uh, dealing with the adrenaline dump is, is physically competing but if you can't do that or you've never competed before you could go in the gym and do mock matches you could do situations where it's like a shark tank so you're in the middle getting you know getting eaten by the sharks and then there's new fresh guys jumping in on you and there's always someone attacking you and then finally i'd recommend like um, you know, like situational sparring in really bad positions. So mm-hmm. if I'm preparing for an EBI tournament, there's a good chance, like I'm pretty confident that I'm, I'm probably not going to get subbed in, in regulation unless I'm going against like a really world-class guy or me or yeah, that's right. But, um, happy you'd have to compete. That's true. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but in, uh, EBI, the, the, my main issue with it is the overtime rounds. So it's like, you know, it, if you just practice, uh, just by rolling for your camp, then you're going to go against someone from 10th planet who has just practiced their overtimes. And then if they get it to overtime, they're definitely going to win because the arm bar position and the back position, like you need to spend tons of time in those positions to be effective if you're in that tournament. So I'd recommend, you know, if you're going into an EBI tournament, uh, granted nowadays they're all combat jujitsu, which I think is unfortunate, but that's another conversation. If you're going to do that, like really spend the time getting, getting in stuck in arm bars. You know, if you're, if you're going against a good leg locker, spend a lot of time target sparring out of the saddle or out of 50, 50, you know, like really put yourself in that position because then if you get put in that position in competition, it'll be more, you know, you're because of your preparation, you'll be more confident. You won't panic as much and you'll be able to make decisions, um, at a higher level. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Another thing that I would recommend at when it comes to jitters, even beyond just the physical prep, a lot of it when it comes to jitters is mental fear. And I would suggest if you're going to do simulated rounds or simulated matches in the gym, make sure that you have a lot of your people specifically sitting there watching you while you do it. That's a good call. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not it's not the 
even the physicality or the intensity that's scary. It's the fact that your ego is on the line. You've got a lot of people, yeah. in, in this case, people that you know, record, you know, some of them recording you, some of them putting out on YouTube, watching you possibly embarrass yourself. That's the scary thing. And it, that's all mental. That's not physical. So my suggestion would be, if you are doing that competition prep, make sure that you have your friends at the gym watching you because that's the thing, right? Like it, mm. you need to be comfortable getting embarrassed. That's how you invest in loss is you let your ego die. And the way to do that is to put yourself in situations where your ego will be compromised and then you get used to it over time. Uh, so I would definitely suggest that if you're going to do like mock matches, even beyond telling people like go, go at competition speed, the most important thing is making sure that people are sitting there watching you. And Matt, you can probably, you know, relate to this, especially when you were, you know, more junior and when you weren't the instructor, uh, much like me, when I was younger, you know, I noticed that when my instructor was watching me roll, I would get, I would roll totally differently. I'd be like scared. I'd be aggressive. I'd make stupid mistakes because I was not focused on the role. I was focused focused on not looking bad in front of my instructor. Yeah. And normally I'd get my ass kicked because I wasn't paying attention to what my opponent was doing. <laughs> That's a real thing. Like It's like when I walk around the gym sometimes when people are performing techniques on each other, they look up, they're like, and they, they fuck it up and they're like, ah, this is the only one I fucked up. It's because you're here, right? Yeah. It's that old thing. But, um, but and I, Sorry, that's what ahead. that's what you got to tell them yeah. though right like yeah. if if the presence of someone you respect watching is enough to fuck you up then you got to train your mind harder that's exactly. basically what's you going train on. your mind um it's like what danaher said he's like there's there's really no difference between tr uh, training in the gym and competing if you think about it as as just another day you know mm -hmm. like you're gonna just do jujitsu anyway so it's just that you have to put your mind somewhere else where there's no crowd there's no lights the stage is, is, you know, it's, it's not a big stage. It's, it, it is all mental conditioning. Uh, one, one more tip I'll, I'll say is like in mock matches, sometimes if I'm playing the role of the referee, uh, we'll be keeping score. And then when there's a minute left, I'll be like, Hey, Gary, I, I, I'm the ref. I fucked up. I gave the other guy two points. So now you're actually down two points. So you gotta, you know, <laughs> like now we're adding the referee variable that like, like maybe you got kind of screwed and you thought you were winning. So now there's a, a, a change in, in pace and now the other guy's winning. So it's really going to be up to you and it's going to stress your system. So little tricks like that, when you do mock matches can really, um, add to your training, uh, experience. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I hope that answers your question. And, and to your point, we're probably going to do a more in-depth series of conversations on specifically competition. Uh, that's coming up soon. That's probably going to be on the Patreon. So actually, on that note, Matt, I put up a poll asking what kind of topics people want us to cover on the Patreon. And run, just the runaway answer by like a ratio of like four to one was game planning. So we were talking about this earlier. We're probably going to put together a multi-part series on almost like a full course on game planning and how you create an effective game plan in jujitsu. Um, that will be something that we put on the Patreon for premium subscribers. Uh, as we talked about earlier, you know, <laughs> during this time, the Patreon has become critically important to keep the lights on for us. So if you want to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash BJJ mental models. Again, that's patreon.com slash BJJ mental models. The premium content is going to be coming up soon and it's available to people at the silver and the gold tiers. Uh, Matt, anything else you want to add before we do the plugs? No, let's do it. Awesome. You know, on an episode about tension and staying loose, we didn't make a single dick joke this whole time. So I'm actually quite proud of us. <laughs> you know, it's because Rob's not here. If he were here, he could not have helped himself. I'm sure of it. Oh, yeah. And talk about Ari. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> That's another. <laughs> He's got like this weird fixation with Ari. I mean, I, I think for us, Ari's more of an amusement. But to like Rob, it's like it's like his Moby Dick, basically. <laughs> um, so anyway, to support the show, of course, the best way to do it is on the Patreon, as we mentioned earlier. You can also go to bjjmentalmodels.com. That's where if you want to learn more about the concepts we've talked about here on the show, we've got a full database of these concepts that we described there. If you want to support us in ways other than the Patreon, you can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash store. From there, we've got gi patches. We've got t-shirts available for you. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash join. That's where you can sign up for our mailing list, where we provide additional content beyond what we offer on the show. Uh, and of course, you can also go to the Instagram or the Facebook, which is where you can follow what we're up to. You can reach out to us and you can also reach out to us through the website as well. So good chat, Matt. I'm, I'm feeling pretty loose right now. Right now.
It's How about you? Loose. Staying loose. It's all there is to do when you're trapped at home. <laughs> yes, true. Anybody else drinking a lot during this time? <laughs> I uh, I think it's not just you. I saw an article in the news today that basically said that like people are warning that you know drinking is not a good strategy for coping with quarantine. Yeah. So clearly this is a real thing. You know, I'm surprised there has not been a run on the liquor stores. You know, everyone's so busy stocking up on things like toilet paper and hand sanitizer. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be locked in my house for months, it's going to be alcohol that I want to stock up on. Yeah, I've actually heard um I've actually heard that liquor sales have been way up and I guess it's just cuz the idle hands, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right guys, well take care and uh, you know again, be careful out there. Um you know, take care with your loved ones and of course, we're here for you if you need us. If you've got any questions as always, please do reach out. We we always respond. So, happy to hear from you. Thanks for the listen guys. Stay loose. <laughs>